I'm David Brenneman. I'm director of collections and exhibitions and also uh, Francis B. Bunzel Family Curator of European Art at the High Museum. Um, if you would please, just before we get started, if you would uh, go ahead and silence your, your cell phones or mobile communication devices, I would really appreciate it. And I think your uh, colleagues out there would appreciate it as well. Um, I'm very excited to be here today and uh, to share with you uh, a little bit about what I know of, I think, one of the greatest uh, works of art uh, made in the history of mankind. So it's quite a, quite a statement. So let me see if I can back that up a little bit. Um, I'd like to thank uh, the generous support from our sponsors of this exhibition uh, and our collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art in New York. And they are our lead sponsor, Bank of America, and also our planning partner, uh, the Rich Foundation. And uh, in terms of the MoMA uh, collaboration, um, that's something that you'll be, you're, you'll be hearing more about uh, in the coming uh, months. So let's see. There we go. Um, I'd like to encourage you to come back on June 25th to hear my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Height, our Margaret and Terry Stent Curator of American Art, who will talk about the American artists who flocked to study with Monet at Giverny at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th centuries. Stephanie worked as an assistant curator at the Terra Foundation, based in Chicago, which until recently ran the uh, Musée d'Art Américain uh, at Giverny, a museum devoted uh, to the art of, of those American artists who went uh, uh, to the colony uh, at Giverny. And she's a terrific speaker. Um, I'd also like to thank my, my research intern, uh, Laura Dickey. Laura, are you out there somewhere? Hey, Laura. Uh, she helped me as assemble the images for this talk, and uh, it was uh, perhaps a somewhat frustrating task because every day I would come in and I'd say, Laura, please put, add this image or add that image, uh, which she did very cheerfully. So thank you, Laura. Um, and uh, finally, I'd like to dedicate this lecture to my late uh, dissertation advisor, uh, Kermit Champa. Uh, Kermit actually organized uh, or co-organized a couple of shows. One of them was called uh, Corot to Monet, uh, The Rise of Landscape Painting in France, which uh, was shown at the High Museum in the very early 90s, and then uh, also worked with me on a, on a show called uh, Monet and Basile, a collaboration. And it was really Kermit who opened my eyes to Monet's greatness at Brown University during his spellbinding lectures um, over 20 years ago. I can't believe it. Um, another little note, uh, I didn't realize, it didn't sink in until really this morning that I would be speaking on the 65th anniversary of, of D-Day. Um, and uh, it just sort of took me by surprise. Uh, the works by uh, Monet um, that we're going to be looking at, the water lilies, uh, really were meant as a memorial uh, to the First World War. Um, but it's perhaps somehow meaningful that, uh, that I'm giving this lecture uh, on those paintings uh, on today. So it's difficult to show Monet's water lilies uh, in slide form because, uh, as some of you perhaps have already seen, uh, they're 42 feet wide. Uh, so they're, it's an extraordinarily uh, big uh, triptych of paintings. This lecture um, is being given on the occasion of the, the public opening, today's the public opening, um, of the focus exhibition of Monet's Water Lilies from the Museum of Modern Art in New York. It is the first in a series of projects with MoMA that will unfold in the coming years. The collaboration with the Museum of Modern Art is intended to provide a rich and immersive experience in modern art. For beginners, it will be an introduction uh, to the great masters and masterpieces um, of, uh, of modern art, and for experienced museum goers, it will provide an opportunity uh, to see old friends in a new light. What better work to begin our MoMA partnership uh, with than Monet's Water Lilies, a painting that has rarely been lent uh, since MoMA acquired it in 1959. In fact, I think less than half a dozen times uh, has the, the triptych left uh, the walls of the Museum of Modern Art. The exhibition of the ex these extraordinary works allows us to consider several interesting questions, both about uh, Claude Monet, uh, depicted here, and uh, about the water lilies. What is Monet's role in the history of modern art? Also, there's an ongoing interest in the issue of old age style 
in all of the arts, not just the visual arts, is the broad, almost abstract approach that we see in the water lilies intentional, uh, or is it the result of an artist who simply uh, could not see all that well and had trouble holding his brushes? And finally, what is modern about Monet's water lilies? Monet is an artist that has captured the public imagination, and we have certainly uh, played our part in feeding the appetite for his work. That is the High Museum. During the course of my almost 14-year career at the High, I've organized uh, two Monet focus exhibitions. Um, and uh, you can see the catalog covers here. On the left, uh, Monet, A View from the River. Uh, and on the right, uh, the exhibition that I referenced before, Monet and Basile Collaboration. Um, and we've also included uh, numerous Monet paintings in, in other exhibitions. Having seen, uh, myself, seen the, the great retrospective of Monet's paintings at the Art Institute of Chicago in 1995, uh, and having brought many of his best paintings to Atlanta, I'm convinced that he is one of the great masters in the history of art. In fact, it was one of the great highlights of, of my uh, curatorial career to purchase one of the paintings that uh, I had seen in Chicago in 1995 uh, for the High Museum of, uh, in 2000. And this is a painting, uh, Autumn on the Seine Argentoy, uh, which is on view uh, right now in our second floor galleries of the Stent Wing um, in the Richard Meyer Design Building. Part of what makes Monet great is that he was able to make important and innovative art from the very beginning uh, to the very end of his long and illustrious career. The water lilies are, in my view, as good as anything he ever painted, but they have not always been as widely appreciated as they are today. Let me tell you a little bit about their history. During the height of World War I, Monet had been commissioned by the French uh, government to d document uh, and depict the war-ravaged ravaged cathedral, cathedral at Reims. And this is the cathedral, um, and you can see that uh, uh, particularly the area around the cathedral has been damaged, but the cathedral itself was also damaged. Um, the government was thinking about Monet producing something along the lines of his now very famous uh, series of paintings of the facade of the Rouen Cathedral, and this is one of uh, the paintings in that series. And Monet actually took up the commission very uh, enthusiastically. He was very patriotic and, uh, and thought that this was a, a good project. Um, however, uh, things changed. And uh, in about 1915 or so, uh, Monet was visited at Giverny um, by uh, Georges Clemenceau, who was, uh, I think, at the time, or perhaps slightly later, uh, Prime Minister of France. And uh, here they are uh, walking in the Garden of Giverny, I particularly love Clemenceau's boots uh, here, and also uh, Monet's shiny white patent leather shoes. Um, they just don't quite seem to fit with the upper parts of their bodies, but, but there you go. They must have really liked shoes. Um, so during that visit, uh, Monet's friend was astonished uh, upon seeing uh, Monet's water lily paintings, which lined the artist's custom-built studio. And uh, these are some photographs which were taken by Monet's dealer, uh, Durand Ruel, who must have just walked into the custom-built studio at Giverny and just sort of uh, snapped pictures as he st stood in the center of the room uh, and just looked around uh, at all these, these pretty incredible uh, paintings. Um, and you can see uh, also that the paintings are on these kind of little um, coasters and so they could be uh, moved around by, by studio assistance, uh, assistance as the artist wished. So when Clemenceau uh, saw these, these paintings, um, Monet had in mind uh, not to do the, the cathedral paintings, but to actually offer up uh, two of these paintings to, to France. Uh, Clemenceau said, no, 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 can't do just two of them. We need a larger group. And if you give us a larger group, we'll build a, a special museum in Paris uh, to show them. And the original site of this museum was, at the, was planned to be at the uh, Hotel Biron, which was the home of, of Monet's friend, the sculptor Rodin. Uh, and it's the current site of the Musée Rodin. And so uh, Monet uh, eagerly agreed and plans were drawn up to create uh, a little pavilion at the Hotel Biron. And 
The pavilion, unfortunately, proved to be too expensive, um, but we do have a reconstruction of, of what it would have looked like uh, over here. And uh, you can see it, it would have been a circular plan uh, and then probably would have had a series of smaller paintings uh, going all around the circular plan. And one of the paintings that's on view in the gallery from MoMA is this really stunning and gorgeous uh, view of Agapanthus. And uh, probably this painting was intended uh, for, for this um, initial installation at the Hotel Biron. Um, as I said, it was too expensive, uh, couldn't be done, and uh, Bonnet was, was, was devastated. Um, he uh, had really put his heart into this. And, uh, and he was devastated. And I think that his, his friend, uh, Clemenceau, uh, saw this uh, and went back to the drawing board and tried to find another site for, for these paintings and uh, was successful. And so what they found was the, the former greenhouse uh, of Napoleon III. Um, it was uh, not in use at the time. It was just on the corner of the Tuileries Gardens. Um, which is currently part of the larger uh, Louvre complex. And so um, this building was identified, and the French um, have, I think, a particular talent for taking great old buildings uh, and, and modifying them and changing them to, uh, to new purposes. And, for example, the Orsay Museum is, is, is one great uh, example of that. Um, so some plans were drawn up. And instead of having one circular gallery... The plan was now to have two uh, oval galleries, which would ultimately uh, require more paintings. So in, the, in that studio uh, uh, that I showed you, there were actually, Monet was working on about 40 uh, large canvases, about 14 feet wide. Uh, and this installation required 20, 20 of those canvases. And so uh, just before um, uh, Monet died, uh, the, the installation got going. It actually didn't open uh, until after Monet died. Monet died in December of 1926. Uh, he was 86 years old when he died. Uh, and the installation of the Orangerie opened in May of, of 1927. Now, when, when the installation opened, and let me show you uh, some recent uh, slides. Um, the, it's very, very beautiful. And I know some of you out there, and I know some of you have been to, to see the Orangerie. If you haven't been there uh, and you go to Paris, you really do have to make it part of your, your itinerary. Um, you can see that there are, on the short ends of the oval, uh, shorter uh, canvases. So this is actually made of two of those 14-foot uh, canvases. And then there are these longer views that are actually made of three uh, of those 14-foot uh, canvases. Um, let's see if I have another. And then here are just some more. It's actually kind of a beautiful collage, but maybe it's a little bit difficult to, to read them. But you're basically, when you walk in, you're surrounded by Monet. Uh, it's a really, really beautiful feeling. Now, keep in mind, when these paintings went on public view in 1927, uh, a lot had happened in, in modern art. Uh, Monet was uh, at the avant-garde in the 1870s and 80s and 90s. Um, but by 1927, uh, things had changed. So uh, on the left, you have a work by uh, Henri Matisse. Uh, on the right, uh, Pablo Picasso. Um, you had Cubism, Fauvism had come and gone. Uh, you have abstract art. You have uh, uh, Malevich. You have Mondrian. Um, so really, uh, there was a question as to how, how new, how modern uh, Monet's works looked uh, at that time. And uh, the critical reaction was, for the most part, uh, very positive. Um, there were, uh, however, a number of artists who, who commented and who were, I think, pretty, pretty mixed about it. Um, Marc Chagall uh, said, I couldn't bear to look at Monet. I discovered him after the war on the steamer bring, bring, bringing me back from America. There on the ocean, I asked myself the following question. From whom does color flow as from a fountainhead? And I replied, Monet. Today, for me, Monet is the Michelangelo of our time from the chemical point of view. I don't really understand that, but it doesn't sound entirely positive to me. Um, Georges Brock said, simply, Monet is a stupid fellow. And André Masson 
uh, said uh, the Orangerie is the Sistine Chapel of Impressionism. So Sistine, not of modern art, but, but of Impressionism, a, a late 19th century movement. Born in 1840, Monet was deeply rooted in the 19th century. For those of you who saw our exhibition, uh, Inspiring Impressionist, Impressionism, the Impressionist and the Art of the Past, you might have noticed our attempt to uncover Monet's indebtedness to the classical landscape traditions of 17th century Holland and France. Uh, our job was, and these two paintings, by the way, were, were in that exhibition uh, and compared side by side. On the right, a painting by Monet. On, uh, on the left, excuse me, and on the right, a painting by Hobema, a Dutch painting from the 17th century. Our job was made more challenging by the now pervasive view, one that Monet uh, himself helped to create, that Monet's work uh, is not f uh, forward, uh, excuse me, is forward, not backward looking. Uh, in other words, that Monet was not a 19th century artist, but a modern artist. And, uh, and let's, so let's uh, see how this view came to be. This is a, a view of the, the old uh, Museum of Modern Art building. Uh, and it was really uh, the Mo Museum of Modern Art that played a key role uh, in helping to shape the perception of Monet as a, as a father of, of modern art. Uh, on the left, you have Alfred Barr, who was the founding director of MoMA. And on the right, you have one of my favorite images uh, from my art history classes, uh, showing a very famous, uh, at least among graduate students of art history, a very famous um, uh, diagram showing uh, cubism and abstract art. And it's, 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 it's an abstract work it's, uh, in and of itself, uh, but it shows, it shows how, how Al Alfred Barr believed that, that all art ultimately flowed back uh, to, to the fountainhead of cubism. Um, even though it's, it's kind of, a, some of it uh, took a, a rather circuitous route. Um, uh, Bar, Bar's views on art were, were very influential, not only through the exhibitions that MoMA created, but also uh, his publications, um, which, which had such uh, diagrams as this. Um, clearly, Barr was a big fan of Cubism and the work of Picasso and his competitor, Matisse. Uh, and that's really one of the reasons why Monet, uh, excuse me, MoMA has one of the greatest collections of those artists' work anywhere in the world. Um, Barr uh, saw the, the rootstock of the tree of modern art and Cubism. However, uh, he needed to adjust his views in light of a American abstract painting of the 1940s and 50s. Uh, and I'll explain more about this in a moment. There we go. This is uh, the Carnegie Museum of Art uh, in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And uh, I just want to point out the image uh, over here. This is a panel uh, from uh, Monet's uh, Water Lily series. Although Monet's paintings were avidly collected by American collectors and museums beginning in the late 19th century, uh, and collectors in Boston and Chicago were, were particularly uh, avid collectors. Monet's later work, that is the work of the period of the water lilies, so work from uh, after 1900 to 1926, the artist's death, um, was not well known and collected here. And this is due uh, largely to the fact that his later, later work stayed in his studio uh, and was not made available until the 1950s. So the works that were selected for the orangerie were taken out, were put in the orangerie, but the other works were simply left in the studio, uh, and, and really nothing happened to them until the 1950s. Um, it was then that the artist's son, Michel, uh, began to settle the estate, and the water lilies were, were made available to collectors. So many works uh, were given by Monet's son, uh, Michel, to the Collège de France, and they were placed in a museum now called the Musée Marmottin. So that's another wonderful little out-of-the-way museum uh, if you're ever in Paris. Uh, so they have a lot of great late work um, because of Michel Monet. Um, and other works were given uh, to uh, sell through a Paris gallery called Katja Granoff. Uh, and so these works, uh, when they came on the market, um, American radar screens went up, lit up. And uh, one of the first over there was uh, Walter Chrysler. Um, and uh, Chrysler's been in the news lately. Um, but, uh, 
Chrysler went, uh, and back when Chrysler was doing really well, um, uh, he had a lot of money and was a, was a great art collector, so he went to Paris, and he actually purchased um, this painting, um, which then ended up in the, in the Carnegie Museum. Um, other, mu other museum directors also showed up, uh, and in an interesting uh, moment of collegiality, three museums, the St. Louis Art Museum, the Cleveland Art Museum, and the Nelson Atkins Museum in Kansas City, uh, bought one of the triptychs, uh, but they split it up. So now each museum has one of these, these panels. So um, this one is the Nelson Atkins. This one is the Cleveland Museum. And this one is in St. Louis. And I think our director, Michael Shapiro, was part of a, a project between the three museums. Um, I actually saw this exhibition a long time ago uh, where they reunited uh, the, three, the three panels. So let me tell you a little story about MoMA, which um, isn't so well known. It's not that they're particularly hiding it, but, uh, but I think that, that it's, uh, it's important to tell this story. And that is that MoMA uh, sent its curo curator over to Paris in 1955. Um, and uh, her name was Dorothy Miller. And she, she found a really wonderful painting, which the museum bought uh, and was taken back to the Museum of Modern Art, where it was installed and much appreciated. Um, and this is a, a view of, of the painting, a black and white view. The reason we only have a black and white view is that the painting burned in 1958. So this is, this is a cause of nightmares to museum directors and curators uh, everywhere. But the painting unfortunately burned. Um, however, fortunately for, for MoMA, um, there were still some paintings that were available through Granoff Gallery in, in Paris. And so they were able to go back uh, in 1959 and we're able to, to buy um, the triptych, which is currently on view in our galleries right now. Yay. And, uh, and they were also able to buy um, another single panel, uh, which is also on view uh, in our galleries. And I have to say, um, this painting reproduces really horribly. When you go see this painting, uh, you will not recognize it um, if, you, if you have this image uh, in your mind. It really, has really beautiful pastel tonalities. It's a really, really lovely painting. Okay, so when the Museum of Modern Art purchased um, the paintings and placed the works in their galleries, they made a powerful statement about Monet's pl place in the history of modern art. Um, but why did they purchase Monet's work? And I think particularly given the, the reaction of, of artists that I, that I read before, uh, why would they do that? As I hinted earlier, something happened in American art uh, of the late uh, 50s, actually late 40s and 50s, um, that could not find its genealogy in either Picasso or Matisse. And that was abstract expressionism and later color field painting, uh, collectively known as the New York School. This is uh, Clement Greenberg, who was uh, perhaps uh, one of the greatest critics of the late 20th century, uh, perhaps the greatest American critic of the late uh, 20th century. And uh, I love this photograph of him, um, particularly with that kind of scowling eye. Uh, it's, he's kind of like the Robert De Niro of, of art critics, you know. <laughs> you looking at me? Uh, and, uh, but he, he, was a, he was a brilliant uh, and incisive uh, writer and critic and um, was really, I think, almost single-handedly responsible for uh, a resurgence of interest in, in the later Monet. In the late 40s, he had traveled to Paris, and he had seen the Orangerie for the first time uh, himself. And he came back, and he wrote a very important essay called The Later Monet, uh, which he wrote, uh, uh, which is really not a very long essay, um, but it's a brilliant one. And in the essay, um, he posited that Monet's later paintings, especially the water lilies, uh, were really the inspiration for American abstract painters of the 1950s. Um, and again, I'm saying this, and he was saying that, even though American abstract painters hadn't actually seen the real paintings. So it's interesting how, how he explains it. He says, uh, 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 even though um, the, the, the painters had not seen uh, outside of reproductions, those huge close-ups, which are the last water lilies. But they were already learning from Monet, as well as from Matisse, that a lot of sheerly physical space was needed for the development of a strong pictorial idea that it did not involve an illusion of more than shallow depth. 
Um, so a little bit of art speak there, but uh, basically he was saying that, that somehow they got a sense that in order to make uh, large abstract statements, um, that, that somehow they, they had gotten this from, from looking at reproductions uh, of work by Monet. And the artists that he were ta was talking about were artists like Jackson Pollock. And, and in fact, yes, uh, you'll notice in abstract painting of this period that they made a lot of really big paintings, um, particularly Pollock. Um, this is a painting called uh, Autumn Rhythm. And another aspect of Monet's work that attracted Greenberg and made the connection for him uh, is that if you look at uh, the work of Monet, if you go look at the water lilies, uh, and look at the way the clouds are painted, you'll notice these very bold gestures uh, that Monet used to paint the, the clouds. And uh, that was something else that, that reinforced uh, in, in Greenberg this notion that, that in fact Monet was, was a kind of precursor of, of American abstract painting of, of the 50s. Let me just show you a couple of other works. Um, and so other artists um, that were kind of uh, a part of this were Philip Guston uh, on the left and uh, Joan Mitchell on the right. And in fact, later in life, I think Joan Mitchell probably would have, uh, you know, sort of uh, admitted her, her um, interest in Monet. She went to live uh, and work in France uh, in the home of one of, uh, in the place uh, where Monet once lived, Vetoy. Um, so she kind of continued to make that connection, um, both through her work, but then also through her, her life, um, that connection with Monet. Um, on the, the right, uh, you see a really wonderful uh, magazine article, uh, which uh, came out, again, about 1960. And uh, the image on the right is one of the late uh, Monet's, one of the uh, Japanese uh, footbridge paintings. And we have an example from MoMA in the exhibition. And then on the left, you see uh, two artists. Uh, on the top, Sam Francis, and on the bottom left, uh, Jean, I think it's Jean-Claude Riopel, a Canadian abstract painter. Uh, and you can see, uh, I don't know if you can see actually the, uh, up here, but it's uh, basically a, a Monet uh, eruption of colors. And, uh, and in fact, you have um, Sam Francis declaring the artist who made uh, this painting uh, and who's depicted up here. This painting, by the way, is in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. Uh, he's, he's saying, uh, I'm doing pure late Monet's uh, in, in, in making these works. Um, now, when would American artists and, and uh, uh, the general public, when would they have been able to see these late paintings? Well, um, it would have been about 1960 through a, a very important MoMA exhibition uh, called Monet's Seasons and Moments, which was organized by this guy, uh, William Seitz. William Seitz was uh, an artist. Uh, he went to graduate school. He attended Princeton University, where one of his advisors was uh, Alfred Barr, uh, the director of MoMA. Uh, and he wrote a dissertation on uh, abstract expressionism. Um, but he also was, uh, wrote articles on Monet, uh, again, as kind of precursor of, of abstract expressionism. And then he organized... Uh, the show at MoMA in, in 1960, which uh, included quite, quite a lot of late work by, by Monet. And uh, I love this photograph over here of him. Yes, this is what I do. You know, I, I get to hang out with the paintings and <laughs> touch them. Um, so uh, the exhibition featured uh, the later work, and, uh, and, and you have things, you know, sites saying things like, uh, that the later paintings tremble on the razor edge where vision mediates between the world out there and the inner experience of the mind, sensibilities, and emotions. Sounds very, very modern to me. Um, so uh, in, in, in placing uh, and enshrining the, the, the water lilies in the galleries of the Museum of Modern Art, uh, MoMA was, in effect, uh, sealing his fate uh, sealing his reputation uh, as one of the founders of the modern school. And, uh, and it's interesting to note that this view is so pervasive that, that uh, other museums, um, uh, notably the Tate Modern, so I'm going to show you just a couple of more installations. I just had to show this. This is actually a <laughs> Kunsthaus Zurich. So the Swiss also were interested in late Monet. Um, this painting was purchased by uh, Emile Burleff for the Kunsthaus in Zurich. Uh, and then they've installed Monet and his friend Rodin side by side. And I guess this guy was play acting a Rodin uh, over here. 
He was tired, too much art. Uh, and then uh, this installation, which is at the um, Beiler Museum, uh, just outside of Basel, Switzerland. Um, this Monet painting uh, is also hanging in a Renzo piano-designed uh, gallery. Uh, and you see this really lovely view. There's a water feature out here and a view out into the garden. Um, but uh, it's a really, really beautiful painting, a beautiful museum. Uh, but as I mentioned, if you go to the, the Tate Modern, uh, you'll actually see their water lily uh, painting installed uh, in a gallery with a rotating selection of abstract paintings on the opposite wall. And so they've hung uh, Pollock uh, opposite uh, Monet and, and other artists as well. Again, um, because of this, this connection uh, that, that Clement Greenberg and then the Museum of Modern Art were able to make uh, in the late 1950s and, uh, and early 60s. So um, was Monet consciously trying to position himself as the potential father of modern abstract painting when he created the water lilies, or are we making too much of Monet's achievement? Perhaps Monet's abstraction, as seen in the water lilies, is simply the result of an artist who could not see very well. And, uh, and these are some really fantastic photographs which show um, Monet recuperating from cataract surgery. He had uh, cataract surgery, I think, about very early 1923. Um, and he had to wear these, these sunglasses, uh, these glasses which were corrective, I think color corrective. Um, and so, uh, and over here, this is a, a photograph that's blown up, and you'll see it in the, the first gallery of the installation in the museum. But if you peek under his hat, you'll notice that he's wearing these uh, color corrective uh, glasses again. In the most recent edition of the New York Review of Books, the critic Martin Filler reviews an exhibition of the late works of Picasso at Gagosian Gallery in New York, in which he foregrounds the complexity of evaluating work produced by artists in their old age. The Germans have a term for this, Alterstil, um, or old age style. Uh, does the broadening and looser style of painters in their late years reflect the depths of insight attainable only through a lifetime of hard-won experience, or is it the result of deteriorating mental faculties and physical ability? Filler concludes that although Picasso made numerous bad works during his later years, he created even more masterpieces uh, uh, in his later years because he was able to pour his life force uh, into the art up until the end. Um, and I just want to show you a couple of works. Uh, so on the left, um, Two Nudes, which is a painting in the collection of the Museum of Modern Art. And the painting on the right, a uh, woman with a hat, uh, uh, still belongs to, to the artist Julian Schnabel. Um, it was, uh, uh, he attempted to sell it uh, recently at auction uh, with an 8 to $12 million um, estimate, and uh, apparently there were no takers. So I don't know, would any of you pay 8 to $12 million for the painting on the right? I don't know. So, um, I have to say that in my view, and that of Filler, generally works uh, generally towards, uh, both of our views really tend uh, towards the view that late style works can be as good or better than early style works uh, when the artist is in full charge of mental and physical capabilities. Um, but there are some cases in the history of art that are challenging uh, to this point of view and that really make us question that. And I, I want to talk about a couple of those. This is a portrait of uh, the Venetian artist Titian, uh, painted uh, very, very late in life. Um, he, he lived a good long time uh, as well. Late style uh, and the issue of broadening technique and viewing distance um, actually appears as an issue in art history as early as the 17th century. Um, and there's a French theorist uh, who, who uh, who wrote in the 17th century, his name was Roger de Peel, uh, who, who wrote on uh, particularly the, the problem of the early and late style of Titian. And uh, in this, this, this slide, you can see an early painting by Titian from the National Gallery in London, and then uh, this late painting, which I think is in uh, Prague in the National Gallery there. Um, clearly, de Peel, writing in the 17th century, preferred 
the early style of Titian because he felt that the painting could be appreciated both from near and from far. So that if you got close to the painting, uh, you could see the beautiful delicacy of the technique, the precision of the technique, um, but you could also move away from it and appreciate the painting from a distance. Whereas the late paintings, um, which he actually equated with the work of Rembrandt, particularly late Rembrandt, uh, and I don't have a slide, but you have to conjure up late Rembrandt paintings with very broad strokes, uh, a lot of paint, loaded paint on the canvas, um, that, that, that moving close to those paintings, those late paintings of Titian or Rembrandt, um, that they looked really kind of uncouth, uh, that they looked kind of primitive, um, and that the artist hadn't actually fully succeeded um, because they couldn't be appreciated uh, close up. So, uh, so it's interesting. So this issue really does, um, does uh, have a, an old, uh, is an old discussion. Uh, so it's not just something that, that, that uh, has come up recently in, in, in modern art. Some art historians have also, also argued that late Titian paintings are simply unfinished, that he just simply never got around to, to finishing them, which is a whole other uh, layer of, of complexity to, uh, to how we can uh, interpret these works. Um, this is the painter um, Edgar Degas, uh, who was approximately a contemporary of Monet. Um, he also lived a very good long life. Um, at the end of his life, um, he was almost completely blind. Um, so this is a very early work on the left from the 1860s, or actually from the 1850s, uh, 1860s, um, and then on the right, uh, a work from the very beginning of the 20th century, and you can see uh, how the style uh, really loosens up in, in these later works. Um, I personally believe that the late works of Degas are, are as good as the, the early works, even though they're not as carefully, uh, carefully done as the earlier ones. Um, there's the case of, of Willem de Kooning, uh, uh, more modern artist, 20th century artist, uh, who actually suffered from Alzheimer's. And so here he is painting, and uh, it is said that, that his assistants actually chose colors for him and handed him brushes uh, later uh, in his life. And so there's a real question of, of who actually uh, made, made those paintings. And here are a couple of examples, painting on the left, uh, Woman One uh, from 1950, uh, 52. Uh, from the Museum of Modern Art. Um, it might be coming to Atlanta. And then, uh, and then on the right, uh, a later work from about 1979. Um, so you, you can be the judge. Uh, and then we have the case of, of Renoir, um, who suffered from such debilitating arthritis. Uh, I don't know if you can see his hands here. Uh, but they were, they, they, he, he couldn't use them at all. So he created little harnesses for his hands, and uh, assistants literally strapped the brushes uh, onto his hands. And so you have a work from the 1870s on the left, and then a work from uh, 1914. Um, I think uh, Renoir, again, is another difficult case to judge. Um, we know that the, the, the painting on the right was painted when, when he couldn't use his hands. Um, but we also know that, that his style changed about 1885, 86, about the time that the Impressionist group began to break up. Uh, the last Impressionist exhibition was about 1886. So I think the change in style uh, in, in Renoir's case can not only be attributed to to uh, the, the fact that he couldn't use his hands uh, and had to develop a new style of painting, um, but perhaps um, also had to do with the change uh, in his, his outlook, his vision, his approach, his desire for a more classical uh, style. Um, in, the, in, in the case of Monet, again, we know that, that he suffered from cataracts, and this painting was done around the time that he was particularly suffering from them. And I've heard um, from folks who have had cataract surgery that after the surgery, colors appear much more, much more luminous. Um, does anyone out there can vouch for that? Yeah, we got a couple. So is this true? Yeah, okay, it's true. Okay. And uh, so Monet made uh, paintings like this one, which is in, uh, the, in the exhibition. Uh, and you can see that, that the colors are really exaggerated, these kind of bright, fiery yellows. I mean, it looks like the garden is on fire. 
uh, and, and, and it wasn't. It was simply how he was seeing uh, those colors uh, because of the cataracts. So we know that he had this problem. Um, by the time he painted uh, some of the water lilies or painted the top layers of the water lilies, we also know that he was correcting uh, his vision. Um, so, uh, so was his late painting uh, the result of, of these vision problems? And I would argue uh, that, that uh, probably not. Um, this painting uh, is in, also in the collection of the High Museum of Art. It's one of our two Monet paintings. It's also on view on the second floor of our stent wing. This was done about 1903. So when he was in uh, 63 years old, early 60s, um, was clearly in command of all of his faculties and yet was making works um, that were at, at least as abstract, uh, perhaps even more abstract than, than the water lily paintings. So I don't buy uh, the argument that, that uh, Monet's paintings look the way they do uh, because he couldn't see or couldn't hold the brushes properly. So uh, what is modern about Monet's water lilies? Um, well, let's look at, look at the paintings, and I encourage you when you're in the galleries to stand in front and to really look at the paintings. Um, you know, what, what do we see? Well, we see a, a, a view, a limited view of the lily pond. Um, there are these wonderful lily pads that are here and here. Uh, you also see the clouds reflected uh, in the water. Uh, there is no indication of dry land here, or here, or here, or here. Um, so there's really no place, uh, if you're trying to project yourself into the painting, there's no place to put your feet. And there's also no, no sense of where things stop or start. Uh, and and, it, and it, for me at least, now you'll have to decide uh, yourselves, for me it creates this kind of wonderful s uh, sensation of floating sort of hovering above the lily pond and kind of looking down uh, at the lily pond and, and ultimately, in a way, kind of being absorbed uh, into the lily pond. Um, some of you may think I'm totally crazy, but that's, that's okay. Go check it out. Closer up, uh, you, you get to see, again, these wonderful brush markings, um, which also give a sense of vivacity to the, to the painting. You, you can literally follow Monet's hand uh, as he makes these, these wonderful gestural uh, marks on, on the canvas. Um, so this question of floating um, or hovering, uh, it's not something that I, that, that I think that I just made up. There are other um, art historians uh, who, have, who have noticed this as well. One of them um, is, is named Leo Steinberg, very eminent um, historian um, uh, who has a kind of a psychoanalytic approach to, to art history. Um, mortality must have weighed very heavily on Monet's mind um, at this time. His son, Michel, uh, had just been sent to the front uh, and the war got as close as 50 miles to, to Giverny, the front lines of battle as close as 50 miles. So he had to have been thinking about it, and he had to have been thinking about uh, his, his mortality. Um, and so in a way, um, uh, I think that, that, that at least I begin to see uh, these paintings as a way for the artist to, to immerse himself in the paintings, uh, to immerse, immerse himself in art and to forget about the problems um, that, that were everywhere, everywhere around him. Now, um, while that's true, uh, it's also true that if you go back through and look, look at the work of Monet, um, he's always interested in water and he's always interested in this idea of floating. So let me show you what I mean. Um, he was born on the Normandy coast um, his, his, uh, his, I think, mother died at a very early, when he was very, very young. His father basically raised him, a uh, very you know, good middle-class family. Um, and so water uh, always uh, appears uh, in his paintings. This is a very early painting, uh, painted very nearby his house. Um, it's a, um, a, a landmark called the, the Pointe de la Eve. Uh, and if you, look, if you were standing here looking this way and you turned around, uh, you would see en fleur uh, and saint address um, behind you. So he's, he's painted water throughout his career. Um, in, uh, in the late 1860s, when he and Renoir 
are in effect creating uh, what we now call Impressionism. The site of this breakthrough uh, was a pleasure garden along the Seine called uh, La Grenouillière. Uh, try to say that 10 times real fast. Uh, basically the frog, frog pond. Um, and uh, you can see it was a floating pleasure garden. Uh, and you see over here uh, folks uh, uh, having a good time, and then there was this little uh, kind of raft out here where it looks like it's going to tip over, um, but there's a pretty good-sized group out there um, also enjoying uh, a, a nice weekend afternoon. And then when he moves uh, to Argentoy uh, in 1872, when he comes back to, to France after the, the Franco-Prussian War, which had also been fairly devastating, um, he comes back and he creates a floating studio. Um, he creates a studio based on uh, one that was made by a friend uh, named uh, uh, Charles d'Aubigny, uh, who had also uh, had one of these floating studios uh, in the 1850s. And again, Monet liked this idea of floating. He liked this idea of being out uh, on water. And here you actually see a painting by uh, his friend Manet, uh, from, I think, about 1874, um, which also shows, um, apparently, Madame Monet went on these little jaunts. I can't believe it, but anyway, there you go. And then again in the 1890s, um, you see Monet returning to the theme of water. Um, this is one of a series of paintings called the Morning on the Seine series. Um, we, had, we borrowed this painting for, for uh, the show that I mentioned earlier, uh, Monet, A View from the River, uh, from the North Carolina Museum of Art. So um, if you didn't see it here and you want to see it, head on up to, to Raleigh. Um, finally, um, the, th the theme of floating uh, is inherent in, in Japanese woodblock prints that, that Monet loved so much. This is his, his dining room at Giverny. If you go and visit today, uh, you can see this wonderful space. And you'll notice that, that everywhere you look are these, these, these fantastic Japanese woodblock prints. Um, the type of, of Japanese woodblock print that he particularly liked were called uh, ukiyo-e, um, which, which literally, uh, which means uh, images of the floating world. Okay? Um, a 17th century Japanese novelist, um, I was trying to find a way to convey what, what was meant by the, the floating world, images of the floating world, wrote, living only for the moment, turning our full attention to the pleasures of the moon, the snow, the cherry blossoms, and the maple leaves, singing songs, drinking wine, diverting ourselves, and just floating, floating, refusing to be disheartened like a gourd floating along with the river current. This is what we call the floating world. So in effect, I think Monet was trying to create uh, his own floating world at, at Giverny, um, a place where he could commune with nature, spend time with close friends, and, and forget the problems of the modern world around him. In his early work, Monet focused on floating as a theme in his art. Um, again, he shows uh, boats, he shows people floating on the water, he shows himself floating on the water, um, in, his, in his water lilies, he seems to project himself and, by extension, us over uh, the water and, uh, and I think, uh, creates this, this, this very, very modern uh, sensation. When I began to think about other permanent gallery installations of one artist's work, I came up with the Rothko Chapel at the Menil Foundation in Houston. And that's, that's what this is a, a picture of. The sense of immersion and levitation that one feels in the Orangerie in Paris is perhaps similar to that uh, of Rothko's installation, which is a space designed for contemplation and prayer. Given the horrors of the First World War, Monet's sense of his own mortality and vulnerability is perhaps not too far a stretch um, to, to think and believe that he imbued the water lily paintings with a spiritual depth that I think is lacking in the earlier paintings of the late 19th century. And again, which I think speaks to their, to their modernity, the water lily's modernity. Whether it's pondering the question of Monet's place in the history of modern art 
or Monet and old age style or late style or the sensation of floating uh, in the water lilies. There's a great deal to think about when, when standing in front of the, the paintings. Uh, and I would encourage all of you, if you haven't yet seen the paintings, I think the museum closes at 5 o'clock uh, this afternoon, to, to go on over and, and, and look at them. Um, there's a great deal to think about in standing in front of those paintings. Um, I think this is ultimately the hallmark uh, of a great work of art. Um, for the next three months, uh, you'll have the opportunity to be in the presence of Monet's masterpiece, and I hope you will take that opportunity to experience what great art is capable of. Thank you.